Welcome to our Psychology 101, Introductory Psychology class. Uh, my name is Dr. Sfari. I'm going to be teaching this class uh, this semester, and I'm really looking forward to, to having uh, new students to the discipline. I, I've been teaching this course for a very long time. I uh, thoroughly enjoy it. It's my favorite course uh, to teach, and I think that, um, you know, one of the real objectives that I have is to convey some of my enthusiasm uh, to you. Uh, in terms of this discipline of psychology. So that certainly will be uh, one of my goals. Uh, now this lecture is one that is uh, primarily about, uh, you know, what the requirements are in the class and uh, a little bit about expectations, um, a little bit about uh, grading and, you know, some of the other what I would call housekeeping things that are also in the syllabus, uh, which you need to, to read and read very carefully. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about a few of those things um, uh, as we go along. Um, so again, this is the scientific study uh, of behavior. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about, you know, uh, uh, what just what uh, psychologists do. We're going to learn a little bit about uh, the uh, the goal uh, of psychology to be able to predict and control behavior to understand what our behavior is a product of uh, and again it's a dynamic discipline uh, something we'll be talking more about in some of our next classes um, that uh, the, the discipline of psychology very interdisciplinary uh, really requires knowledge in a lot of different areas in order to be able to to be a good psychologist these days. So again, um, our, our, my goal is to kind of whet your appetite a little bit uh, as far as this discipline, give you background. A uh, number of you may uh, end up taking future classes in psychology, but uh, my uh, job is to give you a solid foundation uh, in the field of psychology. Uh, so some important points, you know, as we uh, uh, discuss, you know, some of these uh, ground rules. Uh, you know, it, these are absolutely horrible times that we're in right now. I mean, you know that, I know that. Uh, very, very tough times. And you're going to be um, trying your best, you know, under a difficult, a very difficult situation. I'm going to be trying my best. Um, if I had my choice, I would certainly uh, want to be doing face to face uh, instead of doing you know, a, a remote class like this. But, uh, you know, for right now, we can't do that. Uh, that's not a reasonable way uh, to go about things. Uh, so let's recognize that this is not a perfect situation. Let's recognize that uh, you're going to be trying to do your best and that I'm going to be trying to do my best. Uh, but let's acknowledge that, um, you know, if we if we had our choice, we would we would be doing things uh, in another way. But it also opens up some opportunities uh, that I think um, uh, are opportunities that uh, are not available uh, when you're meeting face to face. So, um, again, there's upside and there's downside to this. But uh, but overall, we want to try to make the best uh, of this situation. So. This is a class that's really what we would call a synchronous class, a synchronous remote class. Uh, the comparison that I try to use is that of a flipped classroom. Again, you're going to be viewing lectures, my lectures, uh, online. Uh, um, and again, uh, this is something that is, um, you know, has been done for a while, the whole concept of a flipped classroom. Um, uh, you know, you're going to be obviously doing reading outside of class. You're, you're going to be looking at my lectures. You're going to be looking at other archive material like uh, uh, YouTube videos that I've uh, collected, uh, that I've archived, uh, that are also uh, um, important for you to be to to be watching, taking notes on, um, consolidating what you're what you're watching. Uh, so again, this is in many respects is like a face-to-face -face class because we're meeting in a synchronous manner. Uh, so again, we meet on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, um, and uh, um, you know you need to block out that time because we're going to be having uh, Zoom discussions during during that time. 
uh, we'll also be having exams during that time uh, there will be quizzes uh, as well so I need you need to block off that time and um, uh, again it's uh, an opportunity for you uh, to look at uh, what ordinarily goes on in face-to-face -face, which is the lectures that a professor would give um, to look at those online and then come prepare you know for for class to discuss um, uh, some of the issues th that are uh, presented uh, so you need to be putting your best foot forward in terms of preparation um, you need to to be able to come to class and contribute uh, and the class uh, in terms of the of the synchronous uh, zoom discussion won't work unless you're carrying the load okay I'm there to moderate uh, I, I'm there to kind of get things going and then to kind of funnel your discussion uh, in, in certain ways so again um, that's you really need to to engage in a significant amount of preparation uh, for uh, those discussion uh, sessions that we have uh, another important thing uh, obviously you know you have to have a really good stable internet connection um, you're going to be frustrated uh, if you don't uh, indeed you know you might not be able to um, uh, reasonably think about taking this class uh, if you don't have a good uh, uh, internet co uh, connection so um, in some ways uh, I think this course is going to re require um, more work uh, on your part uh, than is ordinary in a in a face to face class. Uh, certainly, in my situation, uh, I I've had to you know retool some things and dramatically change some things, and I've worked very hard to do so um, uh, to make this a class that that is really going to be an enriching uh, class that uh, students are going to be engaged. Um, uh, by way of you know uh, uh, distance uh, this remote uh, kind of a situation uh, but it's also going to require you to work harder uh, so I think you need to be prepared for that you need to go into this situation with the idea that you know you're going to do the requisite amount of studying outside of class that's going to be needed uh, in order for you to have have success uh, let me tell you a little bit about me um, this, things that I value in my life certainly my family these are my grandchildren I mean this was the picture was taken off um, uh, you know this uh, this past summer uh, and uh, a year ago uh, actually um, so um, you know these are my grandchildren and certainly they mean uh, an enormous amount to me and uh, you know aside from my passion for the field of psychology the discipline of psychology um, I derive an enormous amount of um, pleasure out of my out of my family um, I also have some other passions in my life um, you know outside of psychology in my family I'm a huge New York Giant football fan I've been a season ticket holder for uh, a long time um, and have uh, literally lived and died with the success of that team through the years. Uh, I had a cousin who played for the Giants a number of years ago, and uh, that's how I first got started. Um, and I was an athlete at one time myself, uh, and uh, played the game of football. Uh, so uh, I definitely have a very strong uh, rooting interest and affiliation with the New York Giants. Uh, I'm also a huge Boston Red Sox fan having grown up uh, just a short distance from uh, Fenway Park uh, and I like to remind many of my uh, Yankee fans that uh, uh, my team has won more World Series than their team has uh, over the last uh, 20 years uh, so um, and I don't hold that uh, many wonderful friends that are Yankee fans and we get along uh, fa fantastic uh, but I do um, uh, oftentimes reflect on on some of these things and especially when uh, uh, the Red Sox are winning championships and the Yankees are not um, that certainly um, sometimes challenges uh, some of my friendships in a 
friendly kind of uh, way, but it could be because we needle each other. But again, these are some other passions that I have in my life outside of psychology and outside of my family. I also have a passion for bringing the discipline of psychology to, um, uh, to Southeast Asia uh, by way of the Fulbright program. Uh, Fulbright Exchange Program, uh, I've been able to spend a significant amount of time in Thailand, a uh, country that I've gotten to know extremely well, and I have many friends there, and I regularly teach uh, a class there in the summertime at Chula Longkorn University in Bangkok. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is a um, This was my uh, first class um, uh, teaching psychology, teaching my specialty of behavioral neuroscience. Uh, and uh, this was back in uh, 2006. And um, you know, m these, many of these students have gone on and distinguished themselves. And here's uh, one of them right here who's gone on uh, to uh, get his uh, doctoral degree in, the, in psychology and neuroscience at Northwestern University and is now a faculty member at the University of Otago in uh, New Zealand. Um, after having done his uh, graduate work uh, uh, in the field of uh, neuroscience uh, and psychology, he went on and did two postdoctoral stays, one at the National Institute of Health uh, down in Washington uh, and another at the um, National University in, in Singapore. Uh, and I'm very proud of him and his accomplishments. And I have other students who are also uh, uh, in the field uh, of psychology doing uh, great things in, in their career. So I've been very proud of them. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> my most recent class, uh, this was from a year ago. Um, these students, um, again, uh, bright, very bright, and um, uh, uh, the program that I've been teaching in there now for uh, you know, 15 years uh, is, is one that has steadily grown, and the classes have gotten larger, and there's more and more students that are now interested in this uh, subdiscipline of psychology that we call behavior and neuroscience. So again, that's been an important part of of me in terms of uh, in terms of what I do. Um, so let's let's be clear about the situation that we're in right now. I mean, you're going to be watching these video lectures, and there's also archived uh, YouTube uh, material that you're going to be watching and you're reading and so on. Uh, but those video lectures, you know, that translates to about 40 hours. Um, uh, what that means is that uh, as far as those lecture goes, lectures go, that's about two days um, that are spent on the topic of psychology. And indeed, what that means is the significant work that you need to be doing outside of class. Uh, and probably even more work uh, in, in comparison to uh, a, a normal face-to-face uh, -face class. So um, what that means is that, um, you know, as I noted uh, earlier on in this lecture, you know, you have, you know, some special commitments uh, that probably are greater than what we would ordinarily see. Um, as are my commitments um, are greater, you know, for a distance class uh, like this. So I think that um, with that being said, um, there's some things that you really need to, to pay attention to. Uh, one of the things that I tell students to do is to get a study buddy, uh, and try to get to know other people in class. Um, and, um, you know, I think that it's important um, to, to get contact information from those people and, uh, you know, try to uh, engage them, especially with uh, things maybe that you don't uh, understand uh, so well in class. Uh, you know, oftentimes just talking with another person in class is helpful. Uh, and, and those are things that I, that I try to encourage with this whole study buddy uh, concept. Um, I say follow the one to three rule, you know, for every one hour of video lectures and archive material that you watch, you should be spending an additional three hours studying. 
so that means, you know, as a minimum, nine hours of study each week. That's what the expectation is. And I think it's important to recognize that, uh, you know, I've had a lot of experience teaching in college uh, for, uh, for many years. And one of the things that happens with students that struggle when I do meet with them, um, they, uh, when I ask them how much time they're spending, you know, studying psychology, um, you know, outside of lectures and, and for the most part, those individuals that are struggling say, well, it's about one hour or so a week, one or two hours. That's just not going to get it done. And <clears throat> oftentimes when they make a more serious commitment, they end up doing better. Um, but um, uh, please, please keep this in mind that there is the, this uh, requirement of a really a minimum of nine hours for some individuals. It's much more than that. But um, um, you need really to become what I call a serious student. I'll talk about that uh, as we go. So using your time efficiently, you know, that's crucial. Uh, let's face it, there are an enormous number of distractions in life right now, <clears throat> many of which have to do with technology, but certainly, you know, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, those are some of the big ones. Um, I personally don't engage, don't get engaged in any of those things. Um, take up too much time uh, and, uh, um, uh, I like to, you know, do other things and, and be more uh, productive in, in uh, other parts of my life. Uh, spending time on these things is, is for me, is counterproductive. Um, but we now have documented evidence uh, of the overuse of social media. Uh, and indeed, documented scientific work that has been done in this area shows that overusing social media is linked to a lot of negative things, lower grades, poor health, symptoms of potential mental health problems. These are all associated with um, uh, the uh, overuse uh, of technology, overuse of, uh, of, of social media. Um, so let me talk a little bit about how I perceive my job uh, as a professor, because I think that's important in terms of you know, how you may view, um, you know, college, how you may view coming into a course, a college course. I think it's especially important for uh, freshmen, you know, to reflect uh, uh, upon this. Uh, I really see my job as one in which I'm trying to allow you, give you the opportunity to gain new knowledge. Uh, let's call it the fountain of knowledge. Uh, and uh, some of you are going to be consumed by it. You're going to drink from that fountain a lot. Some of you maybe only a little, some of you not at all. Um, and I accept that uh, as, a, as a part uh, of this whole process. Uh, but, it, but it's not I pitch and you catch. Okay, It's not like filling up a pail. Uh, that's not my purpose. Here's what my purpose is. My purpose is to light a fire, to get people really interested in the discipline of psychology. So lighting fires, that's what I consider my job, you know, getting people turned on to the discipline of psychology. Uh, <clears throat> so again, that may conflict with how you come into uh, a college course and how you view the college experience. Um, I'm your professor, I'm not your teachers. When we talk about high school, you know, we talk about teachers. When we talk about college and higher education, we talk about professors. Um, here's what teachers do, okay? They are paid and indeed they're evaluated on the basis of their effectiveness in preparing you to take and pass tests. That That's really what teachers do in the high school and middle school setting. Okay. Um, professors in universities are not made, they're not paid to make you learn. Let me say that again. Professors in universities are not paid to make you learn. Okay. So when we reflect upon this, there's a clash really between how you come into a college course and how I come into it. 
and you see the university as a place to get a credential. Now I understand that. Okay, you know you want to pass a course, you want to ultimately move towards getting the number of credits that you need to graduate and get your diploma. I understand that, but. Professors really see things differently. We see this really as um, a place where you have an opportunity um, to enrich yourself, uh, an opportunity to expand your horizons. Okay, that's what we view. That's what I view as my principal role. So then, um, the job of a university professor really is not to make you learn. You know, that's decidedly not my job okay that's your job okay not my job our classes again the outside tape lectures okay uh, and again it's going to include discussion uh, of thought questions as well during our zoom classes uh, but no test preparation that's 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 not what college education is about you know you're preparing for the test. I, I don't play a role in that. Okay. So more than anything, what you need to do is to develop what I call critical listening skills. When you're watching these videotapes, for example, the wheels should be turning. Uh, you should be thinking about questions that you have. When you're taking a look at um, uh, some of those archive videos, you, know, you should have questions. Uh, and indeed, our Zoom classes, uh, the success of those Zoom classes are going to depend a great deal upon your preparation and your willingness to engage in discussion uh, about, quite frankly, a lot of very controversial issues uh, in, in the field of psychology. Uh, so uh, again, um, uh, we come at things in a, in a little bit different way. Uh, when we talk about establishing critical listening skills, again, enormous distractions that we have uh, in our lives that have to do with technology. Um, and again, it's, it's not passive absor absorption. When you're watching one of these videotape lectures, um, it's, you know, you should be developing questions. You should be engaging in critical listening. You should be um, asking um, uh, important questions and be prepared to share ideas uh, that you have. Uh, <clears throat> so again, these critical listening skills, um, you know, you should be evaluating things as they're being said, and you should be trying to put things together. <clears throat> this is a cartoon that I really love, um, uh, this penis cartoon. This is Lucy, and she says, so, well, so what do you think? And Linus says, what difference does it make? You never listen anyway. And then Lucy says, I was just making conversation. And then Linus says, when you make conversation, you have to listen too. And Lucy says, you do? Um, the exchange is bi-directional, okay? Uh, I, I can't tell you how many people I've encountered in life who love to talk about themselves, but they don't really want to listen to you and they don't really care anything about what you say. You know, that's decidedly, you know, the opposite of what's supposed to be happening in a college education, in a class, a college class, where you're developing ideas and thoughts and you need to get those ideas and thoughts out, okay, and be able to talk about them. That's really the core of, of what we do. <clears throat> and establishing that ability to, to engage in that process is crucial to you and to your success, not only in this class, but I think in other classes that you take. Um, so you're going to do well uh, to the extent that you make the decision to be a serious student, you know, obviously reading uh, the text, uh, critically listening to those tape lectures and those additional uh, um, archive videos, uh, being prepared for our Zoom class discussions, uh, where, again, I'll be moderating, okay, but, but you're to carry the ball. Uh, you know, I'll be, you know, we'll be looking at a lot of those thought questions that you see in the syllabus, and you need to be prepared to, to be able to, 
um, uh, put forth your uh, thoughts and your ideas. So again, preparation is absolutely crucial. So being a serious student then is something that, you know, you really need to do for, for this class. Again, if you choose to be a serious student, right, <clears throat> and there are some of the requirements that you see right there, uh, then you can have success in this class without question. So how do I go about determining grades? Well, again, there's a lot in the syllabus about this. I'll just give you kind of the core of it. Um, there's four exams uh, that we have in this class. Each one of them <coughs> consists of 60 multiple choice and true false questions at five points per question. So each exam is worth 300 points. Uh, and um, at the end of the uh, course, you know, your lowest exam score is going to be dropped. Um, we'll also be having a total of 15 quizzes uh, uh, during the course. Uh, and again, each quiz is worth 20 points uh, for a total of 300 uh, points. Um, again, those exams, those quizzes that will be taken just like in a face-to-face -face course at the time at which the course meets. Uh, and again, this will all be regulated by uh, uh, Blackboard. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you will be expected to take those uh, exams and quizzes at the time at which uh, they are deployed. Uh, and uh, you'll have more than ample time to complete those, but you'll be doing it over the course of a, of a uh, uh, scheduled uh, uh, class. Um, so it's possible to accumulate 1,200 points in the class. Again, your lowest exam score is dropped. And when I take a look at uh, over many previous semesters uh, of having uh, taught this class, this is what it looks like. Uh, uh, 1,080 uh, 1, points to 1,200 points, A minus to A, 960 to 10 uh, uh, to 1,079, that's B minus to B plus. 840 to 959, that's C minus to C plus. 720 to 839, that's D minus to D plus. And less than 719 uh, is a failure uh, in this class. Um, this class, I don't know how they're going to perform, uh, your class. Uh, maybe you will be higher than this. Maybe you'll be lower than this. Um, this is simply an average uh, that we see here. Uh, students tend to perform well uh, in this class, and I'm, and I'm happy about that. Um, but again, this is what the expectation is, and that's how grades are determined. They're really determined on the basis of what I call the modified curve, uh, that the person with the highest uh, point total, uh, everybody else is, um, you know, rated uh, against that person uh, as far as the determination of, of their grade. Uh, so again, there's more in this uh, uh, in the syllabus, but again, this is uh, how we go, how I go about determining grades. I want to talk a little bit about technology. I want to talk a little bit about um, a fear, uh, a fear uh, that Albert Einstein had. Uh, so let's just take a look at this series of pictures. This is what a day at the beach looks like. Notice how consumed these individuals are with their cell. Uh, this is what cheering on your team looks like. Uh, again, please notice the obsession with uh, cell phones. Um, this is what having dinner out with your friends looks like. Uh, not a lot of exchange that's going on there between those individuals. Uh, instead, it's this obsession with their cell phone. Uh, this is what going out on an intimate date looks like. I mean, they're not really engaged with each other at all. They're spending almost all their time on their cell phones. Um, this is what having a conversation looks like with a, with a close friend. Um, this is what a visit to a museum looks like. Uh, this is what uh, enjoying the sights looks like. And perhaps you can't see it that well, but they're all um, on their cell phones. Um, so um, this was a fear that Albert Einstein had. Uh, and he said, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. I think we're there. I think that we're so consumed by technology now that uh, we spend so much time uh, that our human exchanges, both quantitatively and qualitatively, have, have changed uh, dramatically. And I think that that's a bad thing. 
Um, Albert Einstein really articulated these things uh, uh, long ago. So beware. Uh, nobody, nobody, um, uh, you know, I, I appreciate technology. I absolutely do. Um, it, it's helped me tremendously in terms of what I do. But I also recognize the downside. Uh, and indeed, I think the overuse of that technology is something that has uh, that is just absolutely swamping our our, uh, our people these days. Um, and I, I think that we that we need to back off. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, I think that we're in for uh, some dramatic changes uh, in, in our society. So that being said, um, the single most important thing that you can really do uh, to ensure success in this class is to read uh, the syllabus. Uh, get to know the syllabus. Get to know the requirements uh, in the class. Not just read it once, uh, but read it several times, again, to make sure that you understand what the requirements are. Understand this terminology, ITS. What does that mean? What it means is in the syllabus. Uh, you know, I get a lot of emails over the course of a semester, a lot of emails from students, and a lot of it is questions that they have about some requirement in the class. And for the most part, I would say nine times out of ten, those individuals said they just read the syllabus, they would have found an answer to their question. Uh, so again, please understand this um, and read the syllabus, understand what the requirements in, are in the class, and read it um, very carefully. So in the syllabus, everything is really spelled out very, very clearly in terms of what the expectations are uh, for this class. And you really do need to pay attention to that. Okay, so again, Reading the syllabus is absolutely crucial uh, to your uh, success in the class. And again, it's a contract. So there's no such thing as extra credit. There's no such thing as do-overs. Um, that's a part of the culture that we see in high schools uh, and in middle school, but it's not a part of higher education. So please don't come to me, you know, and try to negotiate a grade. Um, uh, again, that's that's not something that's an acceptable part uh, of higher education. So again, you know about some of the requirements, and indeed, uh, in our next class, we're going to get into uh, you know a little bit of history. We're going to get into uh, whether or not we think that psychology is really a necessary um, uh, discipline. We're going to talk about how psychologists have really helped to solve a number of different human problems. And we'll take a look at that in our next class.